So um, Carbon DeFi belongs to what is now a growing family of what we kind of call concentrated liquidity protocols. And so this started with uh, Bancor V2 back in 2020. And this was essentially the construction that we had at that time. Now, the formulas that described this particular transformation are very different to the ones that we look at today. Um, but it has a very sort of strong geometric uh, purpose that was kind of relevant to the way that that protocol was implemented and used. And so this is a really interesting, uh, I think, concept, especially because it's kind of on the fringe. You'll find that people, even very strong DeFi enthusiasts, have this uh, perspective that there is only one concentrated liquidity implementation, and that's the one that should be used. But actually, every concentrated liquidity implementation should be specific for the system that it represents. And so reparametrizing these equations is actually a very sensible way to get more oomph um, out of them, um, especially when it comes to things like gas consumption, but also smart contract security. So this was actually where concentrated liquidity began. Um, but of course, it's moved on since there. This was popularized about a year later by Uniswap v3, and they parameterized their curves very differently. Um, and so their equations actually look like this, and I'm sure people that have been around the, the field for a little while have seen these types of equations. Now, it, what should be noted is that these equations actually refer to the same underlying mathematical object. They are one and the same thing. And you, what you will see is that as I move through some of these slide transitions, that the colors change and the algebra changes, but the actual shape of the curve and its position doesn't change at all, and that's not a mistake. So this, again, is some of the algebra um, associated with the, the Uniswap v3 curves. And then shifting now into um, the present, uh, present tense, um, this is carbon DeFi's parameterization. Um, and its formulas look like this, right? Again, something that looks completely alien, and that's a bit surprising considering that it actually refers to exactly the same uh, mathematical object. Now, these parameterizations are chosen with very deliberate and very specific knowledge of the system that we're trying to implement, right? So to try and shoehorn something like Carbon DeFi and all of the features that it has into what, either the Bancor v2 or the Uniswap v3 parameterization would have been a mistake because it means that there's a, an enormous computational overhead that can actually be avoided if you just choose better variables to parameterize that curve. And that is essentially what we've done with Carbon DeFi, and I call this kind of the, the third prong, or at least the third major prong of the concentrated liquidity landscape. But I should say that th these aren't the only three examples. There are um, many others that um, have reparametrized these curves as well. Um, I'm speaking obviously from a, a biased perspective. You know, I work for Bancor, and Uniswap v3 is the market leader. Um, but that's not to say that that is inclusive, and I'm not trying to be exhaustive. So please don't feel like I'm you know, leaving anyone out on purpose. So the full system obviously cannot really be described with just a handful of equations, but these are the most important ones. The real invariant equation is obviously the one that people pay attention to the most. The marginal price equation is kind of the one that you would use for an on-chain oracle or something of that sort. And then, of course, we've got the swap equations, either how much can I get for giving this amount or how much... Um, do I have to give to receive a certain amount? Those are the, the two different swap equations. Now, before we get further into this, I think it's worth at least looking at what some of these parameters represent, because you haven't seen them before unless you've kind of read through the, the white papers. So these A and B constants, the lowercase ones, are actually just different parameterizations of the square roots of the uh, high and low price bounds that you would have seen on the Uniswap v3 equations anyway. So this is not a significant re-education. Um, but what might be a little bit unusual is this Z term. And I actually fought with one of our uh, smart contract engineers about how to name this. He comes from like a, a very stout C++ programming background where all variables have to have a single letter. Um, and I wanted to name this as Y int because it actually represents the Y intercept. And you can see that up here. It's where the curve actually strikes the Y axis. Um, but I lost that battle and we ended up naming it Z, but so what? The other two um, variables in these equations are obviously x and y. And you might think you know what these are, and you're probably right, um, because they do refer to the y and x axis. Um, but in Carbon DeFi's case, only one of these uh, axes refers to a token balance. 
So in general, when you see AMMs and concentrated liquidity curves, both of these axes refer to token balances in and of themselves. But what you're looking at when you look at the familiar bonding curve here in Carbon DeFi's case is actually the integrated form of the underlying price equation. So this is not a bonding curve like you've seen before. To my knowledge, we're the first to actually take this uh, approach, and it's nice because it means that we get to separate uh, bonding curves into like their atomicity. So rather than having like a single bonding curve that describes any number of tokens, instead, Carbon DeFi's bonding curves describe only one token, and that means you can compose them as many ways as you want and, and uh, achieve a, a very wide uh, variety of different features. So the short version here is that the A and B terms refer to rate parameters, so prices, and Y and Z refer to token amounts. And the question I wanted to ask is like, what is a reasonable range to support? Because one of the things that we wanted to do with Carbon DeFi was to remove the restrictions that in general are imposed on users when they arrive in DeFi exchanges for the first time. So for example, things like tick ranges, we said that Carbon DeFi should have no ticks, right? Things like fee levels, we said that every single user should be able to choose their own fee level, right? It's not something that's prescribed by the protocol, but something that the user tells the protocol that it should do. And so what are we really sort of getting into? Like, how big of a challenge is this? And it turns out it's a pretty big challenge. Um, and it's because of tokens like this. When you're building a DEX, um, you have to be able to accommodate all the different kinds of ERC-20 combinations that users might want to trade with. So for example, Shiba Inu, which is a relatively worthless, and I'm not saying that because I think it's a bad token, I just mean that its per token value is very, very small, um, versus something like WBTC, which is an extremely precious token, has a very high dollar value. And so when you're comparing these tokens versus each other, you have to ask, like, can we support that rate? Because Shiba Inu versus WBTC has, um, has nine Le uh, leading zeros before you end up with the first significant number. But that's on a per token basis. So this, again, if you actually expand it out into its decimal representation, looks every bit as, um, as uh, ludicrous. And you'll actually note that if we take this naively, you actually can't even offer that rate even if you wanted to, because Bitcoin doesn't divide that far. Right? Bitcoin only has eight decimal places of precision, and so if you're trying to offer an exchange rate beyond that, then exchanging one token for the other at that rate is actually impossible, not because the exchange is bad, but because Bitcoin doesn't have enough decimal places to support it. Now, I said that this is the naive situation because it's actually a lot worse than that because while Bitcoin is an eight decimal token, Shiba Inu is an 18 decimal token. So we need to actually compare these on a per token way basis. What is their least divisible component? Um, and the reason we need to do that is because the smart contracts don't know the difference between a whole token and one token way. At the end of the day, we're just dealing with bits, right, in smart contracts. And so we really should be thinking of one wrapped Bitcoin is actually 10 to the 8 Bitcoin, and one Shiba Inu is 10 to the 18 Shiba Inu, and one ETH is 10 to the 18 ETH, and so on and so forth. So this actually changes the exchange rate from absurd to, I, I don't even know what you would call that. This is so vanishingly small that it starts to lose meaning. So on a token per token basis, we have nine leading zeros, and on a way per way basis, we have 19 leading zeros. So let's call this like one of the extremes. Sure, we can find some meme coin or something that's less valuable than Shiba Inu, and maybe some other meme on the other side of the spectrum which has less decimal places or something, but I'd say that this is kind of at the margin of what we would expect reasonable user behavior to be. Now, appreciate that when you're building an exchange, you also need to support the opposite exchange rate, right? If you've got nine leading zeros in one sense, then the trade in the opposite direction is by definition, the reciprocal. So if we actually flip that chart upside down now, and by the way, you can um, go to our website and explore all of these charts in any token pairing that you like, the, um, the, the price of a single Bitcoin in terms of Shiba Inu is somewhere in the like 2 billion tokens margin. And again, that's on a per token basis. If we take the decimality into account, you end up with this number, which I think is 27 quintillion. Shiba token, Shiba way per Bitcoin way. 
which is huge, right? This is, the, it, this is beyond human understanding, and I'm going to prove it. For those who have let their eyes glaze over, pay attention to this, because I'm going to help you understand just how stupid DeFi is. This is the Burj Khalifa, and it stands at 828 meters tall. And this is a carbon atom, which is 10 to the minus 10 meters tall, one angstrom tall, roundabout. It's so small that you can barely say it has a height at all. And if you were to stack carbon atoms, one on top of the other, all the way to the top of the Burj Khalifa, you would have about 8 trillion something, I think, right? Eight, eight, is that 8 trillion? 8 trillion, 280 billion of, uh, of carbon atoms all the way to the top. Now compare that to the size of Bitcoin and Shiba Inu. Which, which tower do you think would be taller and by how much? Because on that scale, Shiba Inu is still about I think 1 million or 10 million times smaller than the carbon atom compared to the Burj Khalifa. Now the reason I'm bringing this up is that imagine someone told you to go and measure the Burj Khalifa in carbon atoms and how difficult that would be. Well, what's even more difficult is to measure a carbon atom in Burj Khalifas because you have to do both on a decentralized exchange. And this is the difficulty. When I'm talking about precision and accuracy, it's that kind of accuracy. And sure, you think, well, I can do this on my calculator at home, or I can get Python to do that, and that's fine. But on a blockchain, you have very limited memory, and you have to respect that memory limitation. And you also have to respect that if there's a rounding error, that that means that your protocol gets hacked. And there have been, and I'm not going to name any, but many protocols that have had rounding errors in their exchange mechanism that have resulted in their liquidity pools being drained. So you need to be very, very careful about this kind of stuff. So the answer to this question is, what is a reasonable range to support? It's, it's just arbitrary. It has to be as wide, uh, you have to go down to ridiculously small numbers and all the way up to stupidly high numbers. So small and so high that they lose all human meaning. Now, I have written a very, very in-depth blog entry on this, and you can again visit this via our website at carbondefi.xyz. And I'm going to run through just through the Cliffs notes right now about how we approach this problem and, and um, the, the results that we achieved with it. So the first thing that you should note is that when you are dealing with very, very small numbers in a fixed point infrastructure, everything rounds to zero, right? If you ask Ethereum today, what's one divided by three? It tells you, oh, it's zero, right? Oh, what's, you know, what, what's 10 divided by six? Zero, okay? There is no number between zero and one in a fixed point infrastructure. So when you have to uh, account for that, what you end up doing is kind of recreating fractional components inside of calculations. And so what we've done is to actually introduce a scaling constant, which is 2 to the 48, which covers a very, very large um, range of, of uh, prices for us. And then we, um, we basically rework the formulas so as to account for that change in the scale. And this means that rather than storing a, um, a quotient as like two different numbers in memory, instead we can just store a single integer and always remember that we need to divide through by that scaling constant at the end. So here's just a very, very quick example. Again, WBTC versus SHIB. Here's some infinite precision. You can see that the numbers are running off to the right. So we're simulating a blockchain that has unlimited memory, unlimited precision, unlimited computation power, and then comparing Ethereum to that benchmark. Now, because of the way these formulas work, when a user submits their price data at the beginning, this is a calculation that can be done off-chain, which is great. So we can do that with an SDK, we can do that inside of the user's browser, and we can perform a square root, which is in general something you should never try to do on Ethereum. Um, and we can get a very good number that we have a lot of trust in, and then that is the data that gets saved to the blockchain. Now, that number is still ludicrous, ludicrously large because we've scaled it up by a factor of 2 to the 48. So how do we get that down into something manageable? Well, we basically have an in-house floating point approximation method where we, uh, tr we cut off the um, significant digits after the 48th, and then we just scale up that number and store it as, a, um, as an exponent um, at the front of the memory slot. So basically, when you're reading the, the, the smart contracts, it will tell you what the number is and then how many zeros you have to add to it. Now, of course, that means that you lose a little bit of precision, but we're losing it at the 48th decimal place, right? Not up near the front. 
Um, and we do this, obviously, for both price parameters. I can skip through that. Um, and then we can, uh, we can start to analyze what this looks like, both from the maker, who, again, had arbitrary precision in mind when they set up their strategy. We can compare it to the contract, which didn't know what the, ma what the maker wanted in the first place, only the information that it provided. And then we can compare the calculations with to both of those reference points and measure two different types of accuracy. So because of the way that we've organized the data, we can actually fit all of Carbon's contracts, um, at least per user, into three slots in memory. And because of the way that these things are arranged, um, in general, it's uh, it's only ever a single read and a single write. Oh, sorry, it's, it's generally only a single write. That's the one that matters. Reading data from the blockchain is generally free. Writing data is expensive. And so when we're looking at precision loss and accuracy, it's really these two cases that we're examining. We're looking at how much data is lost or how much precision is lost at the time that the maker writes their data to the contract, and then how much precision is lost at the time that someone interacts with that data. And I'm pleased to report that our precision is phenomenally good. So even with all of that bit wrapping and evil bit hacks and things, um, we're getting something like 60 parts per million um, accuracy on coins like Rat Bitcoin and, and Shiba Inu. And of things that are both like, you know, similar value and similar token ways, things like, I don't know, Uni and BNT, um, those have like near perfect precision. And then in the opposite direction, which again should be very difficult, um, so uh, we're getting something like 2.5 parts per quadrillion um, accuracy, which is, again, um, very, very impressive. And that's compared to the maker's arbitrary precision value. Um, when we compare it to the contract, which, again, doesn't know what the maker wanted, only what the contract received, the precision goes up. And we get about 26 parts per octillion under those circumstances. So we're very confident that we've, we've created an extremely robust system. Um, and like I said, if you want to explore how I did this, I've actually made some of the code available for you to test this on your own. Um, it's available via the, the blog entry that I've written for the, the company website. If you would like to reach out to me, um, discuss anything that I've discussed here, maybe you've got some technical issues or you want some advice, I hand out free advice all the time, um, feel free to contact me at any of these uh, channels. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. I hope that this was informative. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions, although I fear I may have spoken for too long. Uh, so my question is that since you are actually losing some accuracy, uh, would it, like, did you pay attention to uh, that not being exploitable in a security sense? Yes, absolutely. Where? So yeah, um, read the, uh, I, I direct you to the blog entry, but yeah, so the, the point that this gentleman has raised is really important. So you're always gonna have a rounding error because there, there is no infinite precision um, anywhere. And so the question is, can you control which way the rounding error goes? And in our case, yes, you can. It's, uh, and it's, it's proven. Um, so we use um, a, a series of, um, of, of very clever uh, implementations in Solidity that allow you to do a multiplication and division at the same time. Um, which means that you can get like a temporary overflow, um, but as long as the division at the end brings it back within the overflow constraints, then you're, um, you're good. And in those circumstances, you can also choose, is it a ceiling division or a floor division? So the short version is, we always make sure that the person trading against a strategy gets slightly less than the perfect amount, so that it always rounds in the favor of the person who created the strategy. If you get that backwards, that's when the protocol exploits happen. Yeah, and you can check that out at carbondefi.xyz slash blog. All right, give it up for Mark Richardson.